that's really fascinating. You know, there's we tend to look at um, certainly in, in military perspectives, and of course the classic you know science way the way that I was I was I learned in school. You learn about Newtonian physics, right? And so any any object in, in motion tends to stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. Force equals mass times acceleration and things like that. Um, I find it really fascinating that you're talking about about an object in space time where both its past and its future in space time uh, has something to do with with the maneuverability. Uh, yes. You know, that's something that our scientists did look at and are looking at. Um, it's, it's, it's certainly very perplexing because our current standard models of physics just just don't allow us to really wrap our our, our, our heads around what we're observing. Um, you know, anything that we would have had, certainly biologically, uh, would have been turned into into pudding, right, inside yeah. inside of something like that. Um, I mean, you can look at, a, at, a, at a, for example, a, a dragster going down, down the road, and it does a quarter mile now. In, in high three seconds and that that alone which is some g-force is certainly not four or five six hundred g-forces is literally detaching the retina from from some of the driver's eyes they're getting yeah. corneal bleeds and they're getting you know concussions by basically damage that you would see consistent with some sort of type of head trauma yeah. because of those accelerating forces um you know do you, can you expand a little bit more about that about theory about about yeah. past and present? I find that fascinating. Yeah. So basically, if you wanted to consider modern rocket technology, fuel systems, and things like, like that, they use jet propulsion, which is basically uh, the con conservation of momentum. So if you know if I throw a ball in this direction, um, one half mv squared, one half mv squared, or mv mv, whatever you want to say it, um, I throw a ball, I get a reaction in that direction. But that's only working with our now state of perception that's only working with our now moment it doesn't include the energy that's coming into that's creating the object or the energy that's being released from the object as it's manifesting within our perception um and so in order to have that you know type of instantaneous acceleration you need to move the past and the future at the same time which which so i like to call the node of manifesting matter so, uh, Alexei, that's that's fascinating. So, let's take this cell phone for a second example. Yeah. And in order for me to throw this cell phone across the room, I have to put energy into it for it to do it. But you're also saying that the phone inherently itself has energy, also. Yes. In it. And also, you're saying there's also energy as well uh, as a result of it, whether it's creating friction as it's going through the air or whatever. So, it's not just energy required to throw the phone, but there is other energy around involving the phone itself um, that maybe, we, you know, it doesn't seem obvious, let's say, to, 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 to most folks when we're talking about, you know, physics, really. Um, right. I had a colleague of mine, a really, really good friend of mine, he still is, is Dr. Hal Pudoff, and, and he and another guy, Eric Davis, and some other scientists did a lot of work for us on zero-point energy. Can you can you explain, because I'm certainly not a physicist, can you explain kind of in your own words what is zero-point energy or vacuum energy? It's the energy of creation um, is the easiest way for me to put it. Um, think of it as the ether. Maybe is a good way to put it. And our entire four, from my understanding, our entire four dimensional perception of reality is being manifested from a fifth dimension, which, which essentially is an energetic vortex. Um, and so that energy that we experience has to do with our frame of motion. And so if you were to essentially tunnel into denser realms of experience, that's where higher and higher energies exist. And when you say, when you say, like, if you can, in, in lay terms, because, you know, my, fortunately, my, I come from my, my daughters are very smart and my wife, my, my daughters get their intellect from, from my wife. Thank God. I'm not as smart. Can you, can you kind of distill that down in kind of a lay, lay terms of, of when you say higher energies and what, right. what, what does that mean? And if I were to, you know, look at this and you're, you're going to explain it to, to, a, let's say a four-year-old like me, um, well, I mean, what does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> energy is related to frequency and also velocity, um, you could say. So if the faster something goes, the more energy it has. And also the higher the frequency something is, the more energy it contains. And so when you think about a vortex and any orbits of any system, 
if you're further away, you need to go faster. But when it comes to creating a frequency within our experience, the closer you are to center is the higher the frequency. So if you think that we live in a black hole, or if that's a perception of some people are making, um, then the closer you are to center would be the higher frequencies, which ultimately are higher energies. That's, uh, cut in that's, or, that's oh, please, because that's well above my pay grade, that's for sure. <laughs> I, well, I've been just working with Alexei, and I, I don't know, I have a kind of a separate theory, which um, I think it, it, it does relate. Uh, I think my theory is more observational on what we see of the physical universe, and Alexei's is more on how it actually would, would work or how uh, the, the engine behind it, I guess, if you will. Um, and really, my theory is just based on size because you're talking about that. So the, if you imagine, um, you know, think of nuclear reactions, uh, there's intense, intense power at the very small levels obviously right and so we were able to tap into that with uh, you know after einstein uh in world war ii right and immediately we we used it for weapons <laughs> you know so i mean i i don't i don't fault any extraterrestrial life that they are here and happen to give us technology uh for not giving us any matter propulsion you know which would destroy half the earth if you you know or could that's well, it's kind of like giving a, a, a loaded shotgun to, to a gorilla, right? I mean, um, probably not a very wise idea, especially when that gorilla doesn't know how to use it and has a kind of a history of being kind of violent towards his, Definitely. Uh, you know. That's a good way of thinking friends. of it, too, because when we use fuel, right, as far as molecule size and reactions, fuel is a bigger molecule as opposed to when you're splitting apart an atom. And so now when you're tunneling into zero point, you're, going, you're getting even smaller than the atom. And so that's why they say infinite energy. Right, zero point. So I guess just to, yeah. so how it would relate is that the the smaller dimensions um, would be uh, I guess higher frequencies. Basically, does that does that make sense, uh, Alexei? Would you yes. concur with that? I, that goes along the same lines of thinking. Yeah, totally. And then as the outer dimensions would be to the the galaxy, the the um, the supercluster. You know the local regions however you go out and that we still have very much to learn about the outer outer spaces but if you look down now you can look down in dimensional levels uh if you look through the physical world um then you're looking through size and that's why i think your atoms um is what we see at a lower dimensional level um so and that relates to i think alexei's argument on the denser regions I think could be coming from the smaller <laughs> points of, you know, yes. uh, where if you imagine how many trillions and trillions of, um, you know, even just cells are in your, uh, I think we have up to a, a trillion cells in your body, right? Is that what we're up to now? If you imagine how many atoms are in there, your, your opportunity for, I don't know, anyway, some dimensional <laughs> relationship. Uh, and then the, the outer dimensions would be based size and density. Um, so I'll just finish with kind of how I understand Alexei. I've been still studying it, right? I read his book and, and study it. <laughs> um, so yeah, seriously. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, so basically is, is what it is, is uh, we're orbiting around around time if you can think of uh, our frequency uh, is a circle that's going around time um, and we're when, when man when we see matter it's because we're going the same speed around it it's coming into phase essentially yep. um, and then that's basically as, as far as I've gotten essentially well, that also helps in for Alexei how does your your um theory on you know the creation of matter correlate with like the textbook version of say dark energy you know which we think now is what 70 percent of the universe or whatever uh, i don't think you know that's I mean? how, how do you how do you kind of correlate how do you kind of tag this thing with that thing that you know what i mean well it's hard, sure? it's hard to describe something we have no real physical evidence of to begin with and when it comes to dark matter and this is something that Chris Leto always talks about, too, um, is the scales of size of organisms. Um, and I almost see dark matter as, you could say, the cardiothoracic system of reality, um, meaning like the, the blood and veins of reality. And, it, and from our perception, it appears that matter forms around dark matter. So dark matter can be considered like tunnels almost within the fluid of experience. Um, that's just how I like to think of it. 